Please turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, verse 13 to be exact. If you did not bring a Bible with you today, I believe you'll find Romans 4 on page 941, 941 in the Pew Bibles, and you'll also find the sermon text printed in your bulletin uh, for your convenience. While you're turning there to Romans 4, uh, in case you weren't aware or in case you needed a reminder, if you ever need to play catch up on sermons you've missed, you can always go to our church website, collegebaptist.org slash sermons. Uh, to find the most recent sermons, or you could just go to YouTube and search my name, Ben Cuthbert, and you'll uh, find our sermons there. And on that note of when you might have been gone, when you might have missed, uh, let me just say, if you haven't been with us the last couple Sundays, while you were away, we have been in the courtroom and in the bank, okay? We've been in the courtroom and the bank the last couple weeks. And in the courtroom, we received a verdict that we did not deserve. And in the bank, we received a credit to our account that we did not earn. So let me explain by way of review. So in the courtroom of human history, the Apostle Paul has explained to us in this letter to the Roman Christians that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That is something we know to be true if we're honest with ourselves. And according to the first two and a half chapters of the book of Romans, we've been reminded of that fact, that sobering fact that we have sinned against God in word and thought and deed, that we have sinned by what we have done and by what we have left undone. And we've learned that sin isn't so much wrongdoing as it is a status of wrong being. And so the verdict that we deserve before the impartial and righteous God of the universe is condemnation. When the gavel drops, we ought to hear the words guilty as charged. And with that verdict comes a, a sentence to eternal punishment, where we experience the eternal wrath of God. That's what we deserve in the courtroom. But in Romans 3, we heard another verdict, a verdict we did not deserve. And that verdict is justification, the opposite of condemnation. Justification is a, a declaration of innocence, not guilt. Or more accurately, we, we could say that it's a declaration of righteousness. And we learn that this verdict of justification comes to all those, but only those who have put their faith alone in Jesus alone. This is a merciful verdict. Not getting what we deserve. This is a gracious verdict. We get what we do not deserve. We get undeserved, unearned, favor and kindness. And again, this is a verdict that comes by faith alone. This is the good news of justification by faith, that, that treasured biblical doctrine that was rediscovered and recovered by the Protestant reformers of the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries that we recognized last Sunday on Reformation Sunday. That's the, the courtroom. But last week in Romans 4, we found ourselves in a bank. And there in the bank, we, we found ourselves observing two Old Testament heroes, Abraham and David. Abraham, as you're probably aware, is a man revered and admired for his righteousness. And most people in Paul's day, they presumed that Abraham's righteous status was something that he earned by his works. Like a worker, you know, who earns his wages and then deposits those wages at a bank as a credit to his account. So they thought of Abraham's righteousness. But Paul told us in Romans 4 that Abraham's righteous status was not something that he earned as a wage, 
by working for God. It was something that he received as a gift by faith as he waited on God. And Paul quotes Genesis 15, 6 to make his point. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. It, Abraham's faith, was counted or credited like a deposit to a bank account. It was credited to him, counted to him as righteousness. So we recognize that Abraham's faith alone, none of his works, counted as righteousness. And then before we left the bank last week, we also learned something from another flawed but famous Old Testament hero that I mentioned before, King David. So Paul, quoting Psalm 32, which was penned by the adulterous, lying, murdering David, we learn that God does not count the sins of a believer against him. Instead, the blessing, the sheer gracious blessing of forgiveness as a part of justification also comes by faith alone. So that's where we've been the last couple weeks in the courtroom and in the bank. And with these images of justification by faith in mind, let's listen to where Paul takes us from here, starting in verse 13 of chapter 4. Here are God's word to us today. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So on this Communion Sunday, time won't really permit us to cover every little detail of this important passage, but I just want to summarize Paul's main idea with this phrase. Okay, here it is. The righteousness of faith depends on the gracious promises of God. The righteousness of faith depends on the gracious promises of God. There's actually a lot packed into that phrase, so let me try to explain this slowly. So the righteousness of faith is just another way of saying that it is counted as righteousness. It's another way of saying justification by faith. It's actually what Paul has been saying to us the last few weeks, that faith alone is sufficient 
to produce a declaration of righteousness by God before God. If you look at verses 13 and 14, it's not doing works of the law, law keeping in a works righteousness sense, or law doing in a wage earning sense that results in this declaration of righteousness. No, Abraham himself lived hundreds of years before the law was formally given to God's people by Moses at Mount Sinai. And we even learned last week that even Abraham's circumcision, which some might have seen as a, a work of the law, even though it was actually a sign and a seal of faith, came at least 14 years after God had declared him righteous. So all this to say, it's abundantly clear, once again, here in Romans 4, as it was in Romans 3, that law-keeping in that doing works of the law sense is not a necessary ground for justification. Paul says that in verse 14, if adherence to the law was necessary, if it was required for justification, then faith would be emptied of its value. See that word there? Faith would be null. Faith would be like a big fat zero when it comes to our righteousness. But as it turns out, faith is worth everything when it comes to righteousness. Faith is worth everything when it comes to being counted righteous. Faith is worth everything when it comes to being justified. According to Paul, and his prime example of Abraham, who preceded the Mosaic Law, we are justified by faith alone. Nothing, nothing must be added to our faith in order to be justified. And it's this teaching of justification by faith alone with which the Roman Catholic tradition takes such great issue. So Canon 9 of the Council of Trent has these firm words for those who believe in justification by faith alone. Listen to what Trent says. If anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, meaning that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification, and that it is not any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the action of his own will, let him be, the one who believes in justification by faith, let him be anathema. So anathema is a term of curse. It's a, it's a term of excommunication. So what are we to make of such a strong condemnation of justification by faith alone? What are we to make of this statement anathematizing justification by faith alone? Especially in our incredibly unique community here in Hillsdale, where there is so much positive interaction between our beloved Roman Catholic friends and neighbors and Protestants. Because after all, in this increasingly secular world, we really do stand arm in arm as co-belligerents with Rome, arm in arm with Rome, in the fight for things like the sanctity of life, or for the biblical definition of, of marriage or sexuality. But friends, keep in mind that these common causes, as important as they are, they do not erase the significant doctrinal differences between Protestants and Roman Catholics. That's acknowledged by the quote that I just read, which is an official document of the Vatican. So I just bring this up to help us remember that while there are many things that we can do in common, there are differences. And if you are interested, genuinely interested, in learning a little bit more about the similarities and the differences between Roman Catholics and Protestants, I want to recommend this little book 
uh, by Ray Galea entitled, Nothing in My Hand I Bring. Uh, actually, the College Baptist Church Elder Board read and discussed this book at our annual retreat uh, this last summer. And we did that purposefully in an effort uh, to be more confident in our own biblical convictions, but also to just be more charitable toward our Roman Catholic family and friends. So we found it enlightening, and we found it helpful, and I just wanted to highly recommend it to any of you and all of you who might be interested in reading it. So let me know if you'd like more information. And on, on this book, there's a whole chapter on justification by faith alone, including, this is important, a clarification on the role of good works in the Christian life. So Galea, the author, he comments on Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 by saying this, Our good works play no part in our being acceptable to God, that is, justified. But they do play a big part in our lives because they are the very reason God has resurrected us to new life in Christ, so that we might do all the holy and good things that he has prepared for us to do. That's Ephesians 2.10. So, keeping God's law does have value in the life of a believer. As far as you're keeping God's law by faith. As far as keeping God's law does not represent trying to earn favor with God, but rather trying to rest by faith. In God's promises. We've seen in the book of Romans, and we will see again, that faith, authentic faith, produces obedience. Faith is the source of obedience. Remember, that's one of Paul's main goals in writing this letter. It's to promote the obedience of faith. We just need to remember that doing the law plays no role in our justification. We must remember that despite our best efforts, we actually do fall short of God's law. The law is good. The law is perfect. It's the standard of righteousness. And it often serves to remind us of our transgressions, as Paul says. It reminds us of the wrath that we deserve. So I say all this just to remind us that we are not justified by doing works of the law, but by faith alone. But this begs a question. Faith in what? Faith in what? As I've said many times before, faith always has an object. Something or someone in whom to trust. Something or someone on which you depend. And here Paul reminds us that justifying faith depends on the gracious promises of God. In other words, faith isn't just like a nebulous thing. I just, I just believe. No, justifying faith depends on, it, it rests on the gracious promises of God. In other words, the promises of God are actually the object of our faith. So let's think about Abraham again. That's who Paul is putting on display as the father of faith, both Jews and Gentiles. God made a gracious promise to Abraham. He made a promise to Abraham that Abraham did not deserve. He promised that Abraham would be the heir of the world, that he'd inherit the world, and that he would be the father of many nations. And that gracious promise came to Abraham when he was a childless old man with a barren wife who was post-menopausal. Like if Abraham was going to inherit the world, if Abraham was really begun, become a father of many nations, it would have to be a gracious gift of God. Because fatherhood at his age Fatherhood with his wife was not something that he could work out on his own. Abraham didn't need a law. He needed a promise. 
And that's exactly what God gave Abraham. He gave him a promise. God made a promise to Abraham. A promise that really defied his natural condition. And it was a promise then that Abraham had to grasp by faith. He had to choose to believe this seemingly impossible promise. And despite his circumstances, Abraham determined that faith in this gracious promise of God was actually the most reasonable thing he could do. Because you see, Abraham's faith, his trust, was informed by the things that he knew about God, the evidence that he had about God's character and God's track record. Look at verse 17. Abraham considered, he thought about the fact that God gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Abraham, pagan man that he was, he didn't know much about the one true God, Yahweh. But he did know this. He knew that God had exercised his power to create life out of nothing. Ex nihilo, as theologians like to say. God created the world out of nothing. So Abraham's faith was not just like a blind leap in the dark. No, it was informed by the power of God that he had witnessed on display in creation around him. And so Abraham reasoned to himself, if God could speak the world into existence, out of nothing, by his very word, surely he could create the life of a baby in the dead womb of my barren wife. So faith rests upon the evidence of who God is, John Stott says this about the role of reason in faith. It's a rather long quotation, but it's worth listening to. So he says this, Faith is believing or trusting a person, and its reasonableness depends on the reliability of the person being trusted. It is always reasonable to trust the trustworthy. And there is nobody more trustworthy than God. Stock goes on to say, behind all the promises, that is God's promises, lies the character of the person who makes them. Abraham knew this. As he contemplated his own senility and Sarah's barrenness, he neither turned a blind eye to these problems nor underestimated them, but he reminded himself of God's power, God's faithfulness. Faith always looks at problems in light of the promises. He knew that God could keep his promises because of his power, and he knew that he would do so because of his faithfulness. That's all stop. Or as put succinctly by Paul in verse 21, look there with me, Faith is being fully convinced that God is able to do what he had promised. Faith is being fully convinced that God is able to do what he had promised. In other words, the righteousness of faith depends not on you, but on the gracious promise of God. Faith is not ultimately about the quality or the intensity of your belief. It's ultimately about the reliability of God to keep his gracious promises. He is able, and so he is worthy of our trust, even when we have to hope against hope. That is to say, even when one's circumstances seem altogether hopeless, we can still trust in promises of God. Now, on this Communion Sunday, the fact that the righteousness of faith depends on the gracious promises of God is just a wonderful reminder for hopeless sinners like us. Because, you see, we are just 
as hopeless as childless Abraham and Sarah. We have transgressed against God's righteous law. We are deserving of his righteous wrath. We are utterly hopeless. We're like prisoners on death row with no hope of appeal, no hope of parole. There's nothing that we can do, no law that we can keep to change our hopeless situation. Like Abraham, we need a promise. We need a gracious promise in which to believe. And that is precisely what God has given us in the good news of Jesus Christ. A gracious promise which must be embraced by faith alone. Look with me again at verses 23 to 25. The words, it was counted to him, were not written for his, that is Abraham's sake alone, but for ours also. It, that is righteousness, righteousness will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who is delivered up for our trespasses, and raised for our justification. God holds out the promise of righteousness to us this morning. And in our hopeless state of sin, he invites us to, to grasp by faith his promise. He invites us to, to believe in him. To take him at his word, just like Abraham did some 4,000 years ago. Specifically, he invites us to believe that Jesus was delivered up to death on the cross of Calvary for our trespasses, for our transgressions. That is to say, Jesus offered his body and his blood as a substitutionary sacrifice in our place. And he also invites us to believe that Jesus did not stay in the grave, but that he rose again proving his victory over sin and death, thus securing our justification, securing our righteous standing before God. This is the promise that he invites us to believe. So I want to ask you, have you been counted righteous by faith in the promise of the gospel? That God invites you to empty your hands of sin and guilt and shame. He invites you to empty your hands of your religious ritual 